Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 7 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled The Unified Body of Christ and is ready for teaching on August 12. It's written by Dr. John McVeigh and read by Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word as it opens to us each day by the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the words to life in our hearts, our minds, our thinking, and in our love for you. And as the unified body of Christ, we come to you today, praying that this unity may continue and be improved. Lord, we see some metaphors in our study in Ephesians this week that we need to take to heart. And uh, as we go through this lesson, I pray that each one of us may be blessed, ourselves, our family, our local churches, and the community in which we have the opportunity of being able to witness. And today I'd like to particularly pray for Michael Official, for Paulo Suarez, for Danilo and Maria Panero in Puerto Rico, for San Car, for Danga Ruth, for Trinda Lee Simmons and Yana Haya and Al Edge Mahoney, and Audrey Walker from Jamaica, from Jasmine in New York, Patricia in New York, and Sharon in Springfield, Massachusetts. Lord, they're just some of the people who are listening faithfully each week. And as we open your word and continue to open your word, we pray for your blessing this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Recently at a camp meeting, I met a long-term friend of mine who I would regard as a mother in Israel, Beth Cosmeyer. And Beth has agreed to read our memory text for us today. Thank you, Beth. I'm Beth Cosmeyer from the Avondale Memorial Church, Kurumbon, Australia. Our memory text is, And he gave the apostles, prophets and evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Let's read that again. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. One of Aesop's fables is called The Belly and the Feet. It goes like this, and this is a quote from Aesop Without Morals by Lloyd W. Daly, page 148. The belly and the feet were arguing about their importance, and when the feet kept saying that they were so much stronger that they even carried the stomach around, the stomach replied, But my good friends, if I didn't take in food, you wouldn't be able to carry anything. End of quote. Paul, however, used the human body to make a spiritual point. For Paul, the human body and the church as the body of Christ is composed of various parts with differing abilities, all of which must work together for the body to be healthy. In Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16, Paul redeploys the body metaphor that he used so effectively earlier in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Christ is now the head of the body, supplying the body with gifted people who help unify the body with each part, each church member, contributing its abilities to the whole. Paul's picture of a healthy unified body helps us understand God's goals for us, to be part of a fruitful church united in Christ. And I'd like to read those metaphors of the body from Romans and 1 Corinthians right here. First of all, Romans 12, beginning at verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So, we being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. 
Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhorting. He who gives, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. And he who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. And we'll look at that uh, also in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 31. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow great honour, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given great honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the best gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. Sunday, August 6. The Unity of the Spirit Read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. How does Paul encourage believers to nurture the unity of the church? Ephesians 4 beginning at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, 
Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Paul begins the second half of Ephesians, chapters 4 to 6, with a stirring call to unity, but in two major parts. First, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, he asks believers to nurture the unity of the Spirit by exhibiting unity-building virtues, as in the first three verses, a call to support with a poetic list of seven ones in verses 4 to 6. Second, in Ephesians 4, 7 to 16, Paul identifies the victorious, exalted Jesus as the source of grace in people who lead in sharing the gospel, in verses 7 to 10, and describes how they, together with all church members, contribute to the health and growth and unity of the body of Christ, in verses 11 to 16. As the chapter begins, Paul invites Christians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, in verse 1. He used the verb walk in the figurative sense of to behave or to live, as he also used in Ephesians 2, verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. And in verse 10... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 4, verse 17, This I say, therefore, that and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. When Paul refers to their calling, he refers to the call of Christian faith, as we read about in Ephesians 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And Ephesians 2, 4-6, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the same chapter, verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of of Christ. Paul urges believers to practice a unifying behaviour that reflects God's ultimate plan, as we read in uh, Ephesians 4, 9 and 10. He begins that emphasis here with his call to practice virtues that lead to unity at the beginning of the chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, such as humility, gentleness and patience. Let's look at each of them in turn. Paul elsewhere explains the term humility in Ephesians 4 verse 2, or lowliness, by adding the idea to count others more significant than yourselves in Philippians 2 verse 3. Humility, then, may be understood not as a negative virtue of self-deprecation, but as a positive one of appreciating and serving others. And we're referred here to Colossians chapter 2, 
Verse 18, Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And verse 23, Those things, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Gentleness, well, we read about that in Ephesians 4 verse 2. It may be explained as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance and also means courtesy, considerateness, meekness, as expressed by Frederick Danker in the Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature, page 861. Finally, patience. Compare long-suffering as well in the translation is being able to bear up under provocation of trials. These qualities, then, all gather around the theme of turning away from self-importance and instead focusing on the value of others. And so to finish today... Humility, gentleness, patience. Think about how these attributes would help unify us as a people. How do we learn to cultivate these virtues? Monday, August 7. Together as one in the one. What seven ones does Paul cite in support of his theme of the unity of the church? What point is he seeking to make with this list? Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul's list of seven ones has a poetic feel to it and may echo a hymn of affirmation used in Ephesus. The first begins by mentioning two ones together. There is one body, referring to the church as the body of Christ, as we read in Ephesians 4, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And Ephesians 5 23, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. And verses 29 and 30, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And also, one spirit we read in Ephesians 4 verse 4. The third one is the one hope of your calling, as in Ephesians 4 4 and Ephesians 4 verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The list then offers three more elements one Lord, a reference to Christ, one faith, meaning the content of what Christians believe, and one baptism. Regarding What Christians believe, we referred to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And Colossians 1 verse 23, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with 
thanksgiving. And Galatians 1.23, But they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And verse 6, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. And then, for one baptism, we read Ephesians 5 and verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And this happens before concluding with an extended description of God as one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, in Ephesians 4 verse 6. What is Paul communicating through this poetic description of God the Father? By virtue of his being Father of all, God is the Creator. The rest of the sentence describes how, once the world is created, God relates to all things, to everything that he made. Paul is not dabbling in the heresies of pantheism, which identifies nature with God, or panentheism, which argues that the world is included in God's being, though it does not exhaust that being. He is rather proclaiming the transcendence who is over all, active rule who is through all, and immanence which is in all of God. Note carefully two ideas about the unity of the church in Ephesians 4, 1-6. First, unity is a spiritual fact rooted in these seven ones, a reality to be celebrated, as we read in Ephesians 4, 4-6. And second, this unity requires our zeal to nurture and grow it, as it says in verse 3. Let's read Ephesians 4, 1-6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another, in love. Endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. There will often be cause to weep at our failings in actualizing this unity. However, whatever our failings, we should rejoice in the work of God in Christ in unifying the Church, rejoicing in the theological reality of the unity of the Spirit, as it said in verse 3. Doing so will empower us to return to the hard work of advancing this unity, but with fresh conviction that in doing so, we are accomplishing God's own work. And so to finish the day, read again Ephesians 4 verses 4 to 6. How does it make you feel? How should it make you feel knowing what it says about our unity in and with God through Christ? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Tuesday, August 8. The Exalted Christ, Giver of Gifts. We read from the New Living Translation, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says, he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. 
what is happening here and what is Paul's point in these verses. Paul here quoted from Psalm 68 verse 18 which reads, When you ascended to the heights, you led a crowd of captives. You received gifts from the people, even from those who rebelled against you. Psalm 68.18 portrays the Lord Yahweh as a conquering general who, having conquered his enemies, ascends the hill on which his capital city is built, with the captives of battle in his train, as we read in Psalm 68.1 and 2. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. He then receives tribute, received gifts, it said, from his conquered foes, noting that Paul adjusts his imagery to the exalted Christ giving gifts based on the wider context of the psalm. And we once again look at Psalm 68 verse 35. O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. If we follow the order of Psalm 68.18, the ascent, Christ's ascension to heaven, as illustrated in Ephesians 1.21-23, occurs first, followed by the descent in which the risen, exalted Jesus gives gifts and fills all things. Ephesians 1, 21-23 Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is Paul's way of depicting the Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. This view is confirmed by Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, which identify the gifts provided by the exalted Jesus as gifts of the Spirit. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We read in Ye Shall Receive Power, page 158, a compilation from Ellen G. White, Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men, When, after Christ's ascension, the Spirit came down as promised, like a rushing mighty wind, filling the whole place where the disciples were assembled, what was the effect? Thousands were converted in a day. End of quote. And so to finish today, however deep these few verses in Ephesians may be, how can we learn to draw comfort from what they show Christ has done for us and will do, especially when he will, as it says in Ephesians 1.23, fill all things everywhere with himself. Wednesday, August 9, Gifts of the Exalted Jesus Drawing on Psalm 68.18, Paul has just described the risen, exalted, conquering Jesus as giving gifts to his people from on high. What gifts does the exalted Jesus give, and for what purpose? And we're referred to Ephesians 4, 11-13, but first, Psalm 68.18. You have ascended on high, you have led captivity captive, you have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. And Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness 
of Christ. Paul identifies four groups of gifted people as part of the treasure trove of the exalted Jesus that he gives to his church. One, apostles. Two, prophets. Three, evangelists. Four, shepherds or pastors and teachers. The structure of the Greek phrase suggests these are a single group. Christ gave these gifts to accomplish important work, as it says in Ephesians 4.12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And, in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This last point was of special importance to early Adventists who were reflecting on the spiritual gifts of Ellen G. White. Does the Bible validate the functioning of the gift of prophecy in the church only during the time of the Apostles? Or does the gift continue until the return of Christ? The early Adventists found their answer in Ephesians 4.13 and shared it through a story about a captain of a ship who was bound to follow the instructions provided for a voyage. As the ship neared port, the captain found that the instructions informed him that a pilot would come on board to help guide the vessel. To remain true to the original instructions, he must allow the pilot to board and obey the further guidance offered. Uriah Smith writes in the Review and Herald, January 13, under the title, uh, January 13, 1863, page 52, under the title, Do We Discard the Bible by Endorsing the Visions? Who now heed that original book of directions? Those who reject the pilot or those who receive him, as that book instructs them? Judge ye. End of quote. We should be careful when we identify shepherds or pastors, teachers and evangelists, since we think of these positions within our own context and time. As far as we're able to determine, in Paul's day, these would all have been lay leaders who were serving the house churches of Ephesus, as we read in 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And Acts 2.46, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And Acts 12, verse 12. So, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying. And so, to finish the day, read Isaiah 5, verse 4. What more could have been done to my vineyard than I have not done in it? Think about this verse in the context of what God has given to us in the ministry of Ellen G. White. How does it apply? Thursday, August 10, Growing Up Into Christ What danger threatens the Christ-like maturity of the church? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Paul perceives an environment not unlike our own in which various ideas such as every wind of doctrine and deceitful schemes are thrust upon believers. He uses three sets of images to describe the dangers of wayward theology. One, the immaturity of childhood, so that we may no longer be children. Two, Danger on the high seas, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. And three, being swindled by clever people, who, like gamblers, practice sleight of hand. Paul uses figuratively the Greek word kubia, K-U-B-E-I-A, dice playing, to mean cunning or trickery, as it says in the New King James Version. 
Paul believes divisiveness to be an important mark of error, that which nourishes and grows the body and helps it to hold together is good, while that which depletes and divides it is evil. By turning from the divisive tactic and to that of tested and trusted teachers, as we read in verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, they will advance toward true Christian maturity and play effective roles in the body of Christ. As you read in Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ, and Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In what ways does a healthy church function like a healthy body? Well, we've just read that. Let's read it again. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself, in love. In Ephesians 4, 1-16, Paul advocates for the unity of the church and recruits the addressees to foster it actively. While unity is a theological certainty, as we read earlier this week in Ephesians 4, 4-6, it does require our hard work, as verse 3 says. One way we foster unity is by being active parts of the body of Christ, we read in verses 7 to 16. Each of us is a part of the body and should contribute to its health and growth. We all should also benefit from the work of apostles, prophets, evangelists and pastor teachers, as we read in verse 11. These, like ligaments, tendons, and every joint of verse 16, have a unifying function, helping us grow up together into Christ, who is the head of the body, as we read in verses 13 and 15. So to finish today, what are some of the winds of doctrine blowing through our church today, and how can we stand firm against them? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Friday, August 11. Two notes help to expand our study of Ephesians 4, 7 to 10. Well, let's read those first and then we'll look at these notes. Verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Number 1. Translating Ephesians 4 verse 9. Some translations indicate that the descent occurred before the ascent. For example, in the King James Version, he also first descended. And that's repeated in other translations, such as the King James Version, the RSV, the ESV, and the NASB. Other translations follow the Greek text more closely, leaving the issuing of the timing of the ascent and descent open. For example, in the NIV, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions, and that you'll find in the ASV, the HCSB, the LEB, and the NLT, which allows for the view expressed in Tuesday's study that the narrative order of Psalm 68.18 should be followed, with Christ's exaltation to heaven, the ascent occurring first, followed by his descent 
in the spirit. 2. Leading captivity captive. In quoting Psalm 68.18 from the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, Paul uses a phrase in Ephesians 4 verse 8 that reads literally, He took captive captivity. Reflected in some translations, for instance in the KJV, the NKJV and the NRSV, but which is widely affirmed to mean he took as prisoners a group of captives, reflected in the ESV, the NASB, and the NIV, and several others. Seventh-day Adventists have often understood the phrase to refer to Christ's act of taking back with him to heaven at his ascension those raised in a special resurrection at the time of his own resurrection as we read in matthew 27 51 to 53 then behold the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These constitute a wave sheaf first fruits of the redeemed that he presents to the Father on his return to the courts of heaven. And we have explanations in the Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1022, The Desire of Ages, page 834, and The Desire of Ages, page 785 and 786. Alternatively, in line with Colossians 2.15, the passage could be taken as a picture of Christ's conquest over his foes, Satan, and his evil angels, who were portrayed as defeated captives. And Colossians 2.15 reads, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. 1. Compare the list of spiritual gifts in Ephesians 4.11 with the lists in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12 and 1 Peter chapter 4. What differences and similarities do you observe? And we start with the spiritual gifts in Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 to 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, and to to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And then later in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 onwards, Now you are the body of Christ and the members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And then Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 8. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And then First Peter chapter 4, 
verses 10 and 11. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And question two in class, talk about some of the winds of doctrine blowing in the church today. Notice how Paul says that we should not be blown about by these winds. What are specific ways that we can help protect ourselves and others in the church from the damage that these winds can inflict upon us? And question three, Paul stresses through Ephesians the theme of the unity. But do we seek unity at all costs? In other words, at what point can the desire for unity become counterproductive? Discuss this. And I just must let you know that I actually recorded this on my computer on the banks of the Tweed River several days ago when I was there for the wedding of my grandson Mitchell, who helped provide the music uh, that you hear between the various days on this podcast. And for those of you who are visually impaired, I'll just describe what I I saw on that occasion because I've had to re-record it. The quality wasn't that good, but the vision is still in my mind. I was sitting in a little pergola and about five metres in front of me over the lawn, there was the drop into the river, which was about 200 metres wide. It was a beautiful blue river. On the far side, there were some trees and acres and acres of cane, sugar cane. And in the distance were the mountains going their bluey grey colour. And up to the right, about a kilometre up the river I could see, was a sugarcane mill. Taking sugarcane and converting it into sugar and alcohol for cars and and other products. And uh, I just wanted you to know that that was a very special event because Mitchell is now a science teacher. He married a science teacher, uh, Natalie Wilson, uh, and The tune that Mitch helped to describe, I've worked out, has probably been played as it is between lessons, or weekly lessons, or daily lessons, about 30 million times over the last 10 years. He helped do that when he was a teenager. Now he's an adult high school teacher at the Lilydale Seventh-day Adventist High School in Victoria, Australia. Edinburgh College, it's called. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. A Genuine Sacrifice, Part 4, by Andrew McChesney. About a year passed, Almira prayed and read the Bible every night to keep the evil spirit at bay. She attended church every Sabbath, enduring painful criticism and even threats from parents, relatives and neighbours. But the rest of her life remained unchanged. She went to school on weekdays and often partied with friends at clubs on nights and weekends. At 18, Almira reached a crossroads in her Christian faith. She came across a question that she could not answer. She couldn't understand why the Bible called Jesus' death a sacrifice. To her, Jesus' death didn't seem like a sacrifice. While he was cruelly persecuted and crucified, he surely knew that he would be resurrected. So how was his death a sacrifice? In contrast, Almira faced persecution every Sabbath, and she felt as though she had sacrificed her relationship with her parents, relatives and friends for Jesus. She had no idea how her story would end. She seemed to have made a greater sacrifice. Stumped, she prayed for an answer. Jesus, she said, I have read that I need to openly tell you about my worries, and you will answer. Here's what I propose. I will read about your life in the Gospels and the Desire of Ages every day. Please reveal to me what your death on the cross means and why your sacrifice was so great. Almira didn't really want to read the Bible or Ellen White's writings, The Desire of Ages, but she forced herself to read both every day. At first, she fought boredom as she read. She didn't have a close relationship with Jesus. 
Even though she worshipped on Sabbath, she lived her own life during the week. Almira kept reading and finally found an answer. She read in the Desire of Ages, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Saviour could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Page 753. This was the answer to her prayer. Jesus also had been afraid that he would die forever, but he had been ready to take the risk for her. It struck her that he had not known the end, just as she did not know how her story would end. But he had risked his eternal life to save her. Amazed by such infinite love, she poured out her heart in prayer. Jesus, even if no one else on earth follows you, I will follow you, she said. She decided to give her life to Jesus in baptism. We'll read more of Almira's story next week. Thank you for your mission offerings that help spread the gospel in Russia and around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.